This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Artery Inc. So it turns out that April is Donate Life Month. So if you go to www.arteryinc.com, that's ink spelled I-N-K, you will find lots of transplant medicine-themed apparel and items that are not only stylish, but also raise awareness for organ donation. And the purchase of certain community collection items will actually result in a donation to Donate Life Wisconsin. So there's another bonus. I think the liver transplant shirt is my personal favorite for this month. But either way, go ahead and use PHPOD at checkout to receive 10% off all orders over $35, and you'll save some money, show your appreciation for our show. Note that the discount does not apply to subscription boxes. Let's get to the show. In an emergency room in 1967 USA, a recently graduated medical student reports for his first day of duty being a doctor. Ah, uh, hello, hello there, uh, can you can you help me? I'm looking for Dr. Fishberg. Who's asking? Oh, I, I am. Um, my name's Eddie. Uh, I, this is my first day as an intern. I was told to come to the emergency room to get started. <sighs> started doing what? Uh, started being a doctor. Ah, hell, it's that time again. Okay, kid, you're in the right place. I'm Dr. Fishberg. Oh, okay. Uh, nice, nice to meet you. Where should I put my stuff? What stuff? Well, I brought. I brought a lunch. Is there a fridge? Or... Yeah, sure. So, so, so where is it? You were serious? Yeah, my, my lunch is right here. The chances of you eating during the shift are non-existent, so you might as well leave it here on the counter. Look, you're going to jump right in, okay? Go see rooms four, six, ten. Write down stuff here on this chart. Or hurry to room four first. I'm guessing that guy's having a stroke or something based on what the nurse said. What? You know what a stroke is, right? Y- yeah, it's... It's the there's a portion of the brain that's been injured because yeah great you nailed it kid go but here you're still standing here while bed four is having a stroke you definitely want to do something about that as opposed to remaining in place as you are now plus bed six sounds like it was a nasty MVC probably should get there soon too what's a what's an MVC a motor vehicle collision a, a car accident might be sick I don't know this this is overwhelming. But you haven't done anything yet. It's going to be a long residency, kid. You better get used to the ER. You're going to be down here all year. But I I want to be a radiologist. Yeah, great. It sounds like a good life plan. But you're starting here in the ER for your first year. But I don't know what I'm doing. This this is my first day of being a doctor. Yeah, you'll probably figure it out. Everyone else did. Look, since you're here, I'm going to take off. So feel free to ask someone else for help or something. It was really nice to meet you. Wait, Wait, where are you going? I'm going to go be a urologist. You're here now, so I just finished my first year residency, and I'm no longer an intern. So I'm going anywhere but here. Wait, 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 wait. No, not a chance. I'm out. Look, there's some other interns over there in the hallway. Maybe go talk with them. I don't know. Sort it all out. They're just all huddled there crying. Yep, that's normal. Why would a hospital put their least experienced doctor trainees in charge of the most stressful and unpredictable part of the hospital? Well, you know, that's a great question that more people should ask. Bye! (laughs) Oh my god, he's gone. Excuse me, doctor? You need me, don't you? Yeah, you've got the coat on. Can you please help us in room four? I think the guy's having a stroke. Okay, uh, stroke is where a portion of the brain is injured. So... Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Come on, we'll take care of you. Come on, this way. Nope, 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 not that way. Yep. Grab your stethoscope. All right, come on. All right, let's go. Good job. Yep, keep walking. There I want to go with the go. other interns. I want to go to the other interns. No, nope, just keep right up here, or I'll help you. We'll, we'll be right beside you. Just right he's he's not there. coming back, is he? He's gone. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, is it 
considered meta to do a show about the historical origin of our own specialty or not quite? Yeah, I mean, this is a historical podcast doing the history of ourselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's... Yeah. Well, what if Ooh. we did a podcast about the history of podcasting about medical Ooh. history? I feel like that's Ooh. one level more Ooh. of meta. I like that. We should do that for the next round. What do you think, listener? If we break the fourth wall, does that make it even more meta? I didn't hear if they said anything. They Did said, I say we let him go. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman. Oh, wow. I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't have any shout outs. Do you guys have any shout outs? Mm. Sadly, no. Hell with them. All right. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> with, that, <laughs> with that, we'll move on to our new segment, round two of Mike's Mailbag. So this is where we decided we wanted to try to ask a listener to submit a medical history article, a story, or a factoid. And we're going to use that basically to make a question to ask Mike on the spot if he knows the answer. But he doesn't know the question until, well, in a few seconds here. And he has to come up with an answer basically just using what he knows off the top of his head. And he was kind of surprisingly close on the first one. Uh, I was not exactly right, but he was pretty darn close, especially for being put on the spot. So I think we, we just want to give you some credit again there, Mike. Oh, thank you. But. That being said, we want to drum up uh, some submissions here, and we want to give a little reward, which occurred to us uh, after we recorded that episode. So, <laughs> so here's here's the game: if you send us uh, again a story, article, factoid uh, with a medical history bit in it, and I'll turn it into a question for you to ask Mike. If you are successful, meaning Mike doesn't know the answer, you stump him. You get to be your very own medical eponym, and so we will see. If that comes to pass, today. have we explained what an eponym is? Is it like a telomere? It is no. not like a telomere. Oh, no, no, then I don't no. Know an eponym is. is when you name something in medicine after a person's name. Uh, so, like you know, uh, Mike's disease, for instance, or Mike's sign, or something like that, right? So. Many thanks go out to Dan, fan of the show, for this week's question. You may, if you were listening last week, recognize that name because he actually sent us that question as well, but we felt bad because we didn't think of a reward until this week. So we're going to use a second question that he had submitted last show to see if he does earn an eponym. So you get you get a second chance at this, Dan. So here's hoping, man. With that, let's see what Mike knows. So Mike, your question today is... Mm-hmm. What medical device patented in 1854 was endorsed by several physicians and scientists of the day as an effective treatment for toothache, hysteria, quote unquote, bad word, we know we said that before, and gangrene? What medical device Hmm. from 1854 was endorsed by several physicians and scientists for those, for treatment of those conditions? Well, hysteria, uh, I'm going to say vibrator. (laughs) Well, you know... I don't remember the year of it, but there is apps. I believe there's actually a direct link to bring that wandering that uterus device. back home, everybody. Yeah, the hysteria- is that going to be your final answer, or? Uh, well, I mean, just if I'm just naming a device, yeah. Uh, you I should just, just try to answer this confidently, like you know what it is. And oh, that's right. Who cares? Oh, duh. Yeah, I know it's vibrators, because physicians back in the day would treat hysteria. I mean, they would have to like, you know, the one way to treat hysteria is to give a female a climax that's how you fix her i love mike's g-rated explanation oh, for this. it like hurts to not God, i don't but anyway that is my final answer buzz 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 <laughs> oh, that's yeah, not what it is, is, is it? <laughs> it is not, you are wrong uh but that would so help r- with everything I didn't say it wasn't effective. Gangrene. I was asking for a specific medical advice. What, what year did you say? 1854? Yeah. Oh, man. I kind of shudder to think. I don't know if I can. Not that I shudder to think what an 1854 ex- vibrator would be. I think there's probably a lot of copper wires wrapped around a yeah, piece of wood. Yeah, I, mean, I, could. I don't well, know. Well, the actual correct answer, Mike, is the patented magnetoelectric machine. Oh, okay. Which was, okay. okay. That sounds like a vibrator. I, I mean, uh, this wasn't. So what this was, it was, it was developed by an inventor named Ari Davis. Not really clear why he developed it, other than it seemed like he did, He just liked to inv- invent things. And this was kind of a couple decades after they figured out if you actually generate electrical current, you put it on skin and stuff, muscles contract. And so even though they didn't really know what to do with that information, there was kind of a belief at this time that like electricity was new and exciting and it probably has medical benefit. And so this machine it had two electrodes and a crank. And so you would crank it, it would just send current through, and you would just 
I, you know, exactly where to use it or whatnot. I did not find the <laughs> instructions, but uh, it's a, a very, I'll, I'll put uh, in our website, I'll put the uh, picture of it, but you can Google it. And it's a, a, an old timey looking box. It looks, <laughs> I'm sure it was not fun. Uh, but uh, he, uh, Ari Davis apparently sold it to a physician named Walter Kidder, who then again, sold the rights to his brother-in-law who ultimately marketed it as a treatment for all the things, including mm-hmm. the toothache, hysteria, and gangrene. Uh, it did not work on any of those things. But technically, you're wrong. So that means not we have vibrator. to give Dan an eponym. It was not a vibrator. Oh, so okay. what is what is Dan's eponym going to be? Well, Dan's eponym will be Dan's sign. Okay. What is Dan's sign? So Dan's sign is... Um, it's, I'm assuming this is a physical exam thing. Physical so exam when we say finding. sign, a lot of times we're talking about like a physical exam finding. Yeah. So this is going to have to do with um, determining um, collagen levels in oh, your epidermis. Okay. okay. Connective tissue stuff? Yeah. So uh, it's an effective uh, screening tool um, for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Okay. That's a little specific. So yeah. if you... <laughs> just that. That's all you can check for. So um, you have to, and it's only for males. Okay. You have to pinch the it's skin of your scrotal sac. Okay. Let it go and see how yep. long it takes. You have to time it and see how long it takes mm. to return to normal. With a stopwatch. <laughs> yes. It, it needs to be a stopwatch. You can't use your phone okay. because those haven't been calibrated. Okay. Then you have to pinch your weenus. So the skin, behind, the your elbow, skin behind your elbow. Okay. And you need to time checking. that. So then the ratio of weenus skin to scrotal skin has to be greater than one. If it's not, then you may be at risk for connective tissue disorder, such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This is about a 54% uh, specificity. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's it's about that, that. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's about right. Like, that's about right. I am sure Dan point. is going to be thrilled with uh, his physical exam finding that is named the ratio after him. ratio of weenus oh. to scrotal skin turgor. Excellent. Um, yeah. There's a lot of signs that have been taken back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah. What the, what's what I'm thinking of? Um. The calf pain with a DVT. Oh, Holman sign. Holman sign. Holman sign. You know, Holman redacted his sign. Oh, no, shit. It was terrible. Yeah, because it's like, this, this actually isn't sensitive or specific, so I'm <laughs> taking it back. The there are people still using it. It's one of the worst signs. Like, Holman <laughs> sign positive. Good, great. You know what my favorite one is? Probably is Levine sign. Yeah, yeah. Levine, Levine sign for the listener is where somebody is having uh, a heart attack, basically. They're, you know, they're, and they and they're clutch clutching. their... Is it, yeah. was it specifically the right hand it's, or left hand? It's the right hand clutching it's the, right the left hand. breast. Left, yep. Just left to center. <laughs> I mean, I saw maybe one or two patients do that, over, like literally mm-hmm. do that over the years. I remember thinking, oh, but, you know, however the many heart is attacks I've point, diagnosed. If you point with a finger, then that's uh-huh. probably not visceral pain. No, maybe You not. take like Levine sign again. Like it's more sensitive than Holman sign, maybe less sensitive than Dan sign. There's uh yep. There you go, Dan. You are very welcome. I think anybody else would love to have something named after them. And uh Do we have to submit you... that to some college of something? No, no, we we just we are physicians, so we just oh. we just said it and, and we now just it named exists. it. So yeah. it's now Dan sign. By the oh, power we'll invested in us. Mm-hmm. All right. You are welcome, Dan. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, well pinching your weenus. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you can pitch your weenus in public and uh, you you're can. not going to get in I trouble. You actually have. can. Oh, yeah. boy. All right. Uh, <laughs> so that being said, we're through the mailbag. What are we talking about today, Mike? We are talking about the history of emergency medicine. That's all right. I'm ready to and learn about our own history. We're going to riff. We're going to riff on this one. No oh, boy. You actually because wrote some stuff down. Oh, I know, boy. but in true emergency medicine fashion, I, I'm not that prepared. So I'm good. I know that I could get through this, but I'm not quite ready to do no, it. But I know that I have to do it. It's as I'm if have this to allow episode it. just I'm showed up. Allow it. And you mm-hmm. gotta just do the best you can. That yep. sounds perfect. Yeah, so, I can't argue with that logic. Go for it. Yeah, truly. So <laughs> interesting. So like if you say the, in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning, there was a physician. God and the people. The physician and God were the same people. (laughs) No. uh, um, It's a new specialty. You know, you think about this, like our parents were alive when emergency medicine didn't exist. And I just started thinking like, what what would have happened if, if you were to have like some sort of emergency? Like, where would you go? What would it feel like? What would it look like? 
get, there's not a lot of great information out there. And you, you, you think about this, you know, we talk about people going to the hospital and people, you know, would go to the hospital to get care, but like, what would it, would they go in the main gate and just go to a reception desk? Mm-hmm. So it turns out like back in the day in these hospitals, up until like the mid 1960s, there was a room. It was the emergency room. And that's why they call it the emergency room. Cause it was the, a room. Oh yeah. It was a single room staffed by a single nurse. And up until I think it was 68. I mean, nowadays it's kind of the same thing. It's just multiple rooms with a single nurse. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you go into triage. So now triage yeah, is kind of like close. what the emergency room used to be, you yeah. know, and this nurse then would, um, essentially run that, that portion of the hospital. So we, we, we kind of chatted about this before, but, um, you know, like mental health care really got decentralized over the course of the last hundred years. How um, we used to have people in asylums and things like that, and they all turned into community-based care. But for medicine, it was all community-based care. And really, um, like urban sprawl after World War II kind of set up this problem where like physicians couldn't get to everybody's places. Like the U.S. just became really spread out. So they mm-hmm. couldn't do home visits. And honestly, I think physicians of the day, like in the – in like the fifties and sixties were really kind of focusing on maybe like lifestyle because they didn't want to be on call all the time. So they just wouldn't go to people's houses and be like, yeah, I'm done at five. But physicians nowadays love being on call. Right. I mean, now it's a passion. Total sea change. There's some people that just are on call, but they're not, you know, they just carry a page around and they have people randomly page them at two o'clock in the morning. They love it so much. (laughs) It's right. No, when um, you show up to residency, I mean, and, and you know, like I, they like graduated residency in 2010s plus uh when you're like you show up there and you're like they throw you a pager and you're just like seriously you guys are using, yeah, definitely still using pagers mm-hmm. yeah that's funny <laughs> no i well, mean i, I saw the sea phone. change with my father-in-law i mean he uh let's see he went to residency hmm, i'm gonna say 60s early 60s and he was he if there were a patient showed up in this room in the emergency room they would call him directly and he had to come mm-hmm. in and see him, mm-hmm. no matter the hour of night, no matter if he had worked the whole day before, it didn't matter. So, like, like before, yeah, it was not a trained emergency physician at all. It was but, just counterpoint. He could walk in that room smoking a cigarette, and nobody cared. That's mm-hmm. so true. He had yeah. that going for yeah. him. Yeah, actually, it was probably people probably trusted him more because yeah, three out of four a cigarette and a scotch. Hey, yeah, three out of four physicians in. recommend camels. You know, at that time, was so. he? So, what was specially practiced? He was a GI doctor, right? So he was, he was not. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he would have his rotation, right? So like he'd be on for, I, I don't, I can't really tell how they used to do it, but either the night or the week, but he would be the guy. Later, it gets more refined. Sure. Like the triage nurse is like, okay, so the, a guy comes in pooping blood. So then she would call the GI guy and he would come in. Sure. But it used to be like whoever just like draw the short, or drew the the short straw had to be there. And it turns out like early on, actually as emergency medicine kind of grows, it's the least experienced people in the hospital. It's the intern that's never worked a day in their life. Is and the intern is the first year resident. Mm-hmm. So the, the you just graduated medical school and now you are now you are a doctor. Good luck. Well and so in in part you guys have probably gotten this too. Like you'll get in there, you get a rapport with some older patients and you know you talk about their evaluation. And then you just start to chit chat. And then they're like, you know, you got a pretty decent bedside manner. When are you going to open your own practice? I don't uh, know if they've ever uh, asked you that. A thousand times. Do you yeah. know why they ask you that? It's because of this. Okay, tell me. It's yeah. because of this. Like when, so when they were young, if they ever had to go to the emergency department, they were taken care of by an intern that was like going to do something else at some point in their lives. And they were just doing this to, because they had to, not because they mm. wanted to. Why didn't they just go to an emergency medicine residency then? Because it didn't exist. Ah, that's right. That's it did right. not exist. No. How did we get there? So emergency medicine starts before the residency. Um, it started as a certification. Certification. <laughs> I, I wasn't even reading certificate. that word. Certificate. Yeah. <laughs> certification. <laughs> oh. Certification. Certific- certification. You just said, yeah. You're I'm pontificating. Off, but, yeah. No. Yeah. So I have hard times with syllables sometimes. It happens. So yeah, there's there's a emergency department in Virginia where I think it was like two or three guys got together and they're like, we're going to be the emergency physicians. And I don't know that any one of them had like ever like finished their training in any one specialty. Mm -hmm. Um, They might've done an intern year someplace. And actually, interestingly enough, the place that we work, there was one guy that hadn't done a residency. He graduated before res or probably like Perry residency area Mm -hmm. or time period. 
and had only done an intern year and learned everything he knew about emergency medicine on the fly or from a book, you know? Yeah. If there wasn't a residency, what was your choice? That, well, they had certifications. Okay. Well, so, but, but you had to go out and do it yourself. So they would say, like, one of the guy, like, one of the founders of emergency medicine said, you know, if this was a Wild West explorer, like, the emergency physician would be the one on the wagon train going out west because mm. they, they had to pave their own way. So these guys had to, like, make their own residencies. And it was funny because they, the thought process early on was that you can't learn emergency medicine in the emergency department because you can't get that specialty knowledge. So you have to go, you know, like go on the wards to learn medicine. You mm-hmm. have to go do surgery to learn chest tubes and things like that. And that kind of like still is a thought process. I think it's it's getting less and less. I think we're doing more and more ER in residencies. Yeah. But like we did, like we did a month of neurosurgery. Right, right, right. Because I mean, I guess the to, to say it, set an example too, let's say you want to be a neurologist, like a, you know, brain specialist, basically a brain brain person not a brain surgeon but a neurologist and and you and that's what you want to do back then you could go to a neurology residency and you might in the first year or so do a lot of general medicine plus a little bit of neurology but there was all that that infrastructure was there and so your second third years on would just be doing neurology stuff you know a little little extra sprinkled in but i guess if you are wanting to be an emergency doctor before there's an emergency residency where they sit and plan this curriculum and try to figure out what experience is best for you there's not much to work off of if there's no residency in existence yet right so what do you do send emergency medicine is a little of everything you don't you never know what you're going to have to deal with so might as well go meet every specialty and follow behind them for you know a couple weeks each do some cardiology do some surgery etc because you you don't know what you're going to see right well and you know it's funny because and this is actually where we train too some of the founders of our emergency uh, medicine residency program were still like working at the hospital when, at least when I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, but across the country, it was all started by trauma surgeons. And really, mm-hmm. there was this there was a consensus paper from uh, the fifties where they um, there was a report apparently about um, trauma care and how it just sucked <laughs> in <laughs> yeah. the country. And so, the paper said. About trauma care, it just sucked, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. So in the fifties, they wrote this paper, and finally they get around like having a consensus in in the sixties, and they just said like the emergency department is the weakest link in the chain of hospital care, and really because it was just pieced together, it really did kind of suck. Um, and they were saying that with as far as accidents go, they thought there were one hundred seven thousand um, preventable deaths from accidents every year. Yeah, I, I'm sure that there's way more now just because our population is so much higher, but this kind of started. So trauma surgeons across the country were the ones starting these programs, which is funny. Cause you think, you know, there is a really close association with those mm-hmm. with trauma surgeons and emergency physicians. Like we, I mean, especially in the tertiary care centers, like we're working hand in hand. Yeah. The big academic hospitals the, the, the or the hospitals that have all the specialties, like, you know, you're your Mayo clinics and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. the, when we say tertiary, that's what we mean. We mean a hospital oh, yeah. that is the highest level of care mm-hmm. has the most resources and probably has a lot of residents in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's this recognition in the sixties that we weren't doing things the right way. This is about the same time was in 1976 or so ATLS. I think there was a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon who had a plane crash, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. And his family got taken you to may the local. Explain what ATLS is though. Those uh, So, Oh, geez. Uh, Advanced trauma life support. So this is a course that we all take and it. It's I can talk about what it turned into, but this orthopedic surgeon crashed his plane. So, but he crashed and then his whole family got taken to the hospital and he was just, you know, appalled by the way everyone else did things. Apocryphally, this, this doctor used that to sort of found this system of trauma care um, called ATLS now. And it it's this a uh, very regimented method of A, B, C, D, E. And he tells you to do things in step. It's good advice for trauma care. Take care of the airway first, and then you do B is breathing, and then you do C for circulation. And we don't need to go through the whole thing because it's like a three-day course. But it does like, the it's systematized trauma care, which is a good thing because then you don't miss injuries and such. And that happened also in the 70s and is a huge part of our residencies too. So yeah, I mean, I think all of this stuff, you know, right in the 60s and 70s, I think people were recognizing, as Mike was saying, that, yeah, you know, we don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> we had, an, yeah. Yeah, really not we had no that. system for what to do. Mm-hmm. And I see how we get there, starting with a lot of trauma care, you know, as trauma surgeons uh, or surgeons you know, with a lot of trauma background are basically trying to formalize at least that part of emergency care. Yeah. And really, well, and then, this... 
Go ahead, Mike. Oh, just at this point in time, like emergency rooms are just for like absolutely terrible things. Like you don't go there if you're, you know, like you had diarrhea, you know, you don't go there. You right. wait and you go see your doctor, but like there's other reasons why it becomes a little bit different later on. I think, you know, being informed by trauma care, I mean, this was also a time period when a lot of people were coming back from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, so you have at the same time, some EMS folks could probably correct me a little bit, but you also have this sort of nascent uh, movement to create EMS systems as well in the 60s and 70s. And this whole concept of like taking people from the battlefield to a hospital came back from Vietnam where they were medevacing people, you know, from the field back to the hospital, which is kind of what we do now. We take people from where they get injured and bring them to the hospital. So they have that same model starting at the same time. So you had these mm -hmm. EMS services growing out of the community in the sixties and seventies. Cause it used to be before this time, I mean, ambulance transport services were essentially hearses. They would go find yeah. you and like put you in a car and drive you to the morgue. I mean that, mm -hmm. yeah. and so their ambulances as well only date back to the sixties and seventies. And I don't know the exact dates, but like that's when all that started. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff was sort of coming together at the same time. Yeah. I didn't really touch on that, but you're right spot on Aaron. So back, we talked about this, this department in Virginia. I'm sure there were more across the country. This is just one that I had stumbled across. This guy named James Mills Jr. Cause we'll give some names, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Started this full-time practice. It was, I think it was three physicians, but they had agreed to give 24 seven staffing to this emergency department realizing three, three physicians in that group. <laughs> yeah. Well, think about it though. Like people, like we could probably do that now if we were seeing like six people oh, a day. Jesus. Just do well, okay, all right. fair enough. But yeah, not with the volumes that we're seeing now. They're in Alexandria. Be well, because you said, I mean, it was kind of really, you know, you went to the emergency department out of complete like desperation. The death and dismemberment department. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like in, from the 60s to late 60s or early 60s to late 60s, there are, you know, little departments are popping up here and there. You know, physicians are agreeing to cover these places. You're getting one person there rather than having the, the nurse have to call like, an on-call specialist and do their thing. So then like our big national, I guess, organization is ASEP, the American College of Emergency Physicians. That's Acronym. founded in 1968. So that's before a formal training program. Um, this is even before the certificate. And it, this is, um, there's a guy named John uh, Wiegenstein and uh, Dr. Knockfor. They're both in Lansing. But anyway, it initiated or started in, in Lansing, Michigan. Um, and they were just trying to like come up with what an emergency department should be like. Um, so then they have this, this meeting and they call it the scientific assembly. I think we've all been to one of them at least, but it was in 1969. So they had 120, it's a national conference. They had 128 physicians, which is crazy, right? Yeah. So, um, after that they have their, like their position paper and they say, this is what a residency should look like. This is what a practice should look like. And then in 1970, the first ER residency opens um, in Cincinnati General. Um, the first resident was a guy by the name of Dr. Bruce Janiak. Okay. Um, nice looking guy. T-shirt, <laughs> smile, like, hey. But still wasn't board yes. certified because they didn't have handsome. a board yet. Uh -huh. Handsome. They didn't yeah. have a board. Handsome fella. Yeah. So <laughs> Glad he's handsome at least. Dashing. Yeah. Mm. So the, um, this guy, the guy that started, his name was Herbert. So this is weird because there's all sorts of specialties that are involved. And who knows? Like maybe something happened to somebody that these people cared about, like the orthopedic surgeon in the plane. Mm -hmm. They're like, something has to change. So this guy named Herbert Flessa, he was a hematologist. And he, all I found was that he wanted to improve emergency care. So ER used to be under, and like it was still, there were residual things when I was in residency with this too, but we, it was initially under, it was like a, a certification under family practice. So like, you know, family practice residency, and then you got your sub certification in emergency medicine, kind of like they mm -hmm. do like family practice in sports medicine or OB or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's two years, but I think it was only just two years. It was intern year, that second year. And they and only good. did they only did two months of emergency medicine before they graduated. Because eh, again, what they else didn't could think, there be? <laughs> yeah, right. They're like, there's no way you're gonna learn everything you need to know sitting down in that room that you're gonna work in for the rest of your life. I don't know if this comes up later in the uh, what you're going to talk about, but I, I just like would want to put myself in the position of being because you and I and Aaron, of course, we're all at one point interns or brand new residents, right? And to say that you don't know much that you're, you know, you, you learned a lot in medical school in the books, but you don't, you don't, you're not really 
in medical school in charge of a lot. And then once you are, it's sort of your brain has to change quite a bit because you may know a lot about certain diseases or you've mo a lot of medical school is learning about a lot of diseases you may never see because those diseases may explain like how a certain part of the body works. But when you hit the real world, you're not really dealing with those. You're dealing with a lot of more common things like abdominal pain and all these, you know, these common complaints, but you don't have quite the understanding of what the treatments are. You know, you may have read about some of them, but you've never actually ordered them. And, uh, you know, there's it just to try to imagine putting somebody with that level of experience into an emergency department that is only drawing the most insane cases because they're the absolute worst of the worst you know it's like i don't i don't know how scary it must have been to be like well, this person who just got dropped off is you know a gunshot wound to the chest you've never taken care of that you definitely don't read about that in medical school uh you, yeah you read about the chest you read about the heart you read about the lungs but what do you actually do when those are punctured i mean there's a lot of procedures that have to happen immediately and be recognized and so it is insane to have had the least experienced people doing that stuff and even the ones who begin and they're like i want to do this without having a framework to actually learn all those skills and then be bold enough to go out and do it is pretty pretty insane it is insane these people were insane because people would say that we're insane <laughs> like you know when you get into an er residency you're insane like insane too but there's they're just there's they're just a we're just a little bit off you know yeah no. Well, and if you listen to the people talk from the 70s, like when they have panels and such, like they were the ones that were willing to go down and just man the ER for the night when there was no support or backup. I mean, they didn't have, so they would just, whatever came in, they would try to solve it. And, you know, we, I don't think they had in the 70s, I don't think they had pathways or, or people to call for backup. They didn't probably have a call schedule. They're just like, well, nobody else wants to be here. So it, it's me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but Very then they, little... over time, you know, those people also said, we need to do this better. And this is a legitimate specialty, which is, mm -hmm. that was the big switch to flip, I guess. It was, and it really, it opened the door and I, I didn't look, it, you know, ER apparently in 79 is named the 23rd medical specialty. Like, and I don't know, there must be more now. Named by Actually, like the official board, like by, uh, yeah, American Board of Medical Specialties, oh. like ABMS. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. If you could see, they said that the, like it cracked the door to oh my all God. these other things. There's like 160 now. <laughs> Jeez, well, yeah. So like, trail What's the most obscure one. Uh, give me a minute. <laughs> I mean, blood blood banking transfusion medicine is a specialty now. Wait, which one? Blood blood banking transfusion medicine. So that only okay. that, yeah. Right. Um, you There's got a whole bunch of geriatrics. So you got three geriatrics: geriatric medicine, geriatric psych, geriatric. I'm looking at the list on the career the AAMC geriatric website, which is the you know, <laughs> well, people neurontology. Neurotology. Mm, neurontology neurotology so otolaryngology it, it's a subsection of yeah di just diseases of the inner ear temporal bone and skull base that's it oh that's all that's, you do that's my literal nightmare that's it that's it's nothing like vertigo else. all day oh yeah. my god the worst vertigo and like certain forms of hearing yeah, loss take everything you <laughs> can think of and make it pediatric and the, all of those are now specialties right <laughs> all right well that's just like they're padding the list though well, yeah, you think totally. about it, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, emergency medicine is like legitimate, right? And we don't, we only have a couple, we've got toxicology under us, sports medicine for some reason, which <laughs> doesn't, doesn't make sense. And then, yeah, um, I mean, that's kind of shared with, yeah, critical yeah. care, which also doesn't, does and doesn't make sense. Cause I would say, like, I'm good at critical care for about 45 minutes. And then after that, <laughs> yes. like, I'm just exactly. like, well, yep. sure. <laughs> yeah. We we would be the doc that would be okay, like being you know the patient comes into the ICU, like all right, but then after about an hour, like I, I mean, morning rounds, just like, they're stable. Oh God, it's somebody so else's job bored. now. Yeah, we had do this. I had a, a situation today where something happened. They needed they needed me in the room. Everybody's a little bit jazzy. Go in, take care of the problem. If that problem would have recurred within forty six minutes. I'd have just thrown my hands up in the air. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's perfectly good policy. Yeah, I've already okay. done the things that I could do. <laughs> so we had, so yeah, so this is all the seventies, right? So, oh yeah. So yeah, seventies. And so now like places are popping up in 72. So we get Cincinnati general then you get Louisville. Most of them are in the Midwest. Most of the residency programs, 
University of Chicago is a big one because um, Rosen started that one. Mm. And Rosen is the author uh, of like, our yeah. big textbook. Every, every specialty has like their major textbook, like, and you just call it by the author's name. Mm -hmm. So in emergency medicine, you have Rosen and you have Tintinale, which were kind of the two big ones when I was there. I think Adams mm -hmm. is making a, a push yeah. for third, but, uh, the, the two, the, the funny Rosen was the, 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 the Rosen textbook is like, was like multiple volumes, tons of information, very thorough. Tintinale was a little bit more, I mean, by concise, I mean, it was only like 2000 pages as opposed mm. to 6,000. It was one um, book versus three. Yep, but you had people on like both camps that were like, nope, it's, we're a Tintinale residency or we're a Rosen residency. Uh, I remember one time, uh, one of the places I had interviewed, they said, we read Rosen here. I'm like, all right, great. It's, uh, <laughs> all right. I liked it. It was <laughs> just, like clams. I felt like it was, it was written a little bit differently. Rosen's was, but I have. Yeah. It's like them. the Mandalorian. Do you take your helmet off or not? <laughs> <laughs> this is the way. It's exactly. The I, same I knew a guy who worked with Rosen. He, he, uh, I think he, I'm trying to remember what he, uh, retired. I think in our graduation, probably early two thousands. The guy was still pulling shifts up until the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's how young we are. Like the, the Titans of our mm -hmm. specialty are, we're still practicing up until, you know, Beyonce was the right. queen. We're older than emergency medicine as a as a residency trained specialty. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, maybe not, not <laughs> Max. <old>. I am. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Two years. I was two years old when the first board certified ED yeah. physician graduates residency. <laughs> Man, tiny Mike in the 70s with his bell bottoms on. Mm -hmm. Bell bottom onesie. I was usually naked. Mm, well, as you should be. Mm -hmm. A baby in the 70s? Man. Yeah. Everybody else was naked too. Why not the baby? We couldn't afford clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so as they decided to formalize this and they become uh, like they become uh, an official specialty. So when does that happen? That happens uh, late 70s? So yeah, like middle 70s, like 75. It said found there are about 31 residencies in the country. Um, 79 becomes a medical specialty. So it, it becomes a specialty. And then that first um, graduating class comes out in 1980. So it was all oh, so like... Five-year residency? So, no, no, no. It was... Oh, um, it, it started as... I think it started as three. And then when we were there, remember there were some four-year programs. Mm -hmm. There's some that yeah, needed transitional are. years. And I don't know what they're kind of gravitating to now, but I think it was initially two years, two years sort of certificate um <laughs> three-year residency and now there's three and four years you know mike you you alluded to kind of how things change from like when they were just like a single room and very few cases but i'm guessing something happened along the way yeah so yeah you get this urban sprawl and then you know docs don't want to do house calls anymore just because it's impossible to get to everywhere mm -hmm. um that they need to get to so medicine gets centralized to the hospital and it used to be that like only like poor people went to the hospital because they couldn't afford having a house call. They couldn't mm -hmm. afford going to the clinic or only really sick people did. So like people just didn't go in and healthcare really, even in the fifties and sixties, like wasn't great in the country. It's, you know, some would argue that it's still not great. You know, it could be improved, mm -hmm. but so the more and more people started going to the hospital as like EMS got better, more sure, ambulances sure. were coming in. They were staffed then 24 seven. You couldn't get a hold of a physician. So you just, you went and you, you, saw one yeah so then like i think it was yeah towards the late 70s as these residency programs are getting better we're we're telling people like come in and get seen you can see in all hours of the night doesn't matter just come in whenever you feel like you're sick people then start to decide like what services do i need rather than apparently there was a, a big push nationwide to remind people not to go to the emergency department there's like ad campaigns and like the more you know things. you're saying back then or now because i've seen them now yeah back then it's like don't go to the er if it's, if you have a tummy ache, like this is for people that are dying, but you know, people didn't really heed those warnings and it, it's probably one of, it's the most expensive care that you're going to get, but it's the most like expedient. You're going to get seen that day. Mm. So it, people are just, the hospitals were losing money. They, they ended up starting to turn people away. Like, you know, you don't need to come in. You don't have an emergency. Don't come in. People have already decided that they have an emergency and it was a big dissatisfier. And I'm sure that like there are bad cases that happened. I'm sure people died just because, you know, if we're doing that, we're, we're going to be, you know, turning away people that actually need our help. Oh, yeah. If you're, if you're, if your campaign is trying to decrease the amount of people coming into an emergency department, you are by probability going to miss some big things. Right. 
you know, so, big dangerous conditions. Yeah. So in 1986, and don't ask me to explain exactly what this is, but the the Cobra Law was or Cobra Act. Could you Act, explain what that no, law is? No, I already said I'm not going to do ah. that. Maybe Aaron could. But um, Aaron, can you explain what that law is? Cobra Law, I'm not as familiar with. It's the same year as the as Mtala, which is we can talk about that. And the, the Cobra, Cotton Mouth and Rattlesnake Agreement. Yeah, but Cobra is. Yeah. I, I think it's essentially like you can't turn people away. Oh. Because yeah, of their yeah, ability to it's, pay. It's the same thing. So yeah. the Consolidated Omnibus Re- Reconciliation Act is mm. MTALA is <laughs> right on part the tip of, of my that, tongue. Is mm-hmm. part of that. Yeah, yeah. So what yeah, go ahead. So Mike. people started coming in and that even even though they didn't have the ability to pay, you couldn't turn people away anymore. And we get this today. Well, like we take But care so of where them. did it come from, right? So before that, everyone now people show up and we have to see them and they know that mm-hmm. but before this that's where the cobra came from yeah they so would if you didn't have away. insurance the hospital would just say we're not seeing you and they would mm-hmm. this whole patient dumping thing happened where the hospitals would literally sometimes bus patients to other hospitals and leave them there if they didn't have insurance and they would just say well, we're not seeing you because you can't pay mm-hmm. and that's what this act was in response to so it said well you can't it made it they just said well let's not deal with the problem of why these people can't pay for medical care? Let's just make it illegal to dump them. So, which is crazy though, because if our you know if our mothers were pregnant with us and they didn't have insurance, they could have been turned away, right? In the yeah. system, like yeah, mm-hmm. during Up their until lifetime. 1985, well, I, I believe, 86, yeah, absolutely. Wasn't, I think that was the founding of Mtala, wasn't it? It yeah. was. Uh, I want to say it was two Chicago hospitals that one was diverting any pregnant patients who were of lower socioeconomic class class. Yeah to a different hospital yeah. that w- would take care of indigent care. And, and I can't remember which hospitals is, you know, it's something you, anybody could look up, but, uh, and then that, that was part of the seed that started people saying, you know what, it's strange that a hospital could turn away emergency cases or, and that's why Mtala has labor in the, you know, emergency benefits with, with the, yep. the so labor, the labor is, is the last yeah, two is like, and that's because that means little not work but people in labor, baby, yeah. labor. <laughs> people in labor about to have children should not be turned away from a hospital because there was a time when they would, if, yeah, didn't, uh, yeah. If so the it, hospital at that time thought they didn't have means, they could actually say, "Why don't you go down the street?" Yeah, I mean, try not to have the kid on the way. Don't push, <laughs> and uh, and and obviously, bad things happened because uh, that's what <laughs> babies yeah. don't wait for convenience, right? <laughs> so, so the the reason why people show up at our emergency rooms now and they get seen is because of this this law. Mike's exactly right. So we have a it's a federal law that says we have to recognize and stabilize emergency medical conditions, including labor within our, the ability of the hospital to stabilize them. And, and it's, if you violate it, you get a big old fine and you can't turn people away. So it essentially forces hospitals to provide care to folks regardless of coverage, which is why George Bush in a, uh, George W. Bush in a, a, uh, which debate was this? I forget which year it is when he was, he basically said, we have universal health care. It's called the emergency room. And on, on the one hand, everybody got mad at him. And on the other hand, he's, he's right. That, that is the right. way that we provide universal coverage is we say, well, everyone can go to the ER no matter whether they have insurance or not. Unfortunately, there's nothing in MTAL that says we can't bill people. So people show up, they don't have insurance. We, then we bill the heck out of them. And I'm not saying that we don't do it to be mean. The hospital system does that to recover the costs of caring for all these folks. But that all goes back to, as Mike said, the COBRA law, which included this MTALA Act in 1986. And it's sort of the foundation of our current system of care that uh, you can go to any emergency department and you have to be stabilized. But stabilized is where the problem is. Most people. I think regard, oh, we're going way off on a tangent here, but mm-hmm. most people regard stabilization as sort of less than complete care. So for example, the, the big one, you have a lot of folks with no insurance who are victims of gun violence in cities. Um, and I'm not trying to pull up the gun control debate. I'm more just talking about any number of assaults for they, they get surgery and they might have, for example, part of their intestine diverted. So they have a bag on the outside of their belly called an ostomy. And stabilization includes the placement of the ostomy and the surgery to fix the direct damage, but it does not include the surgery to fix that ostomy and reattach the colon once it's healed to the other part of the colon and put it back inside your belly. So you have a lot of folks, for example, who get the ostomy done, and then they're just stuck with that forever. No. Well, yeah, because the stabilization is, so that's like one of the unintended consequences that comes up oftentimes when you talk about MTALA. Well, they're stabilized. Mm -hmm. But then they don't get optimal care because optimal care would be to like put the colon back inside the belly (laughs) 
and they don't mm-hmm. get that done. So, you know, it's created a lot of unintended consequences, but it's the reason why anyone who goes to any ER will get seen and stabilized for sure. And I would argue that a lot of us, I'd say most of us don't even look at like that status, like emergency, like uh, insurance status. Right. Mm-hmm. They get no. seen. Like we don't Can't. look at that as just like you come in, you do what we, because we, we do that acute short-term care. We're not involved in the long-term care. So we're, you know, we do that stabilization, but for that, we're seeing them, they're getting a full ED workup. Yeah. And then we're figuring out what to do with them. Yeah. I mean, our, our minimum standard is what's called a medical screening exam. So you, you have to provide an exam such that you rule out an emergency medical condition, but that's tough. That could include a, appendicitis in an otherwise well-appearing individual. You would have missed an emergent medical condition that required stabilization, that required surgery. So that's why you check into the ER. You almost always get fully seen and you get a bunch of workup done. And we never ask, we never ask like, what's your insurance before you're seen? Cause it's, you know, kind of illegal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we cannot we, screen based on your one insurance. One should not state. make a decision in the no. emergency department about, you know, based on those things. Yeah. That's where it, it can lead to a lot of strife, especially for patients on their end, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is actually, I was, I was looking this up while you guys were talking, um, but if anybody's actually really interested in taking a good deep dive in this, I'll include it in the show notes, but uh, I found that documentary I was th- speaking about uh, before, but it's called uh, 24-7-365 the evolution of emergency medicine. Hmm. And it was actually, um, I found out about it through EMRA, which is the Emergency Medicine Residency Association, Residence Association. And uh, it was a, I believe it's free to watch through this link. Yes, it is. Uh, an hour long. It's, it's pretty fascinating. It'll give you a lot more background. And uh, it, it will actually, it, they do interview a lot of the folks who were there at the beginning. Um, I believe Rosen's interviewed in it and everything like that, but it was a really cool documentary to watch. I believe we watched it in residency and, uh, it's, uh, it kind of gives you an interesting insight into our specialty because it is a very much new upstart specialty, at least relatively speaking, uh, in the world of medicine and it has kind of, we have our own little ethos. We have our own little way of seeing the world because of that, I think. And as we alluded to before, you know, a lot of the things, a lot of the stresses of the American healthcare system fall to the emergency department and we, we do, we do our best to handle it, you know? Yeah. I think any individual provider is, is going to want to take care. I mean, that's this, the roots of our specialty go back to those people who said, yeah, I'll go down and cover the emergency department mm-hmm. as an intern and I'll figure out what to do for you. I mean, that's, you kind of have to be willing to do that. I think. We I mean, still do that. I mean, you yeah, think about on a I'm daily sure. basis, there's, there's something that you're going to have to figure out that's a problem that you haven't faced before, e- even if it's something minor. You just, it's like there's always a curveball. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, and Emtala M- provides a safe haven. So folks that are homeless or cold or found in an unsafe environment, uh, either in their home or out in the community, are brought to the emergency department. And that person has to be fully evaluated and then screened for conditions. And during that, you often find out you might not have a safe place to send that person. So we're sort of that. That's why we end up being the de facto, you know, safety net for a lot of folks. And I don't think any of us really begrudge that. I think it's frustrating that we often feel we don't have good solutions and everyone else is more comfortable to say, oh, we don't, we can't help that person. And we aren't able to say that. And that's overall a societal good. Um, but you know, I mean, we can't, (laughs) it's a lot of stuff we just can't solve. Mm -hmm. So once they're stabilized, you know, that, what do you do after that? And that, that gets to a more difficult problem. Well, I mean, that's at least, uh, I think a general overview of kind of how this specialty got started and, uh, there's, there's a lot more to cover, but not enough time. So I think it's reasonable to leave it there. With that, we do appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from you, all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you can find links to our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts. Send us a medical history fact uh, there as well to test Mike's innate knowledge and try to win your own medical eponym. And uh, if you have time, go ahead and leave us a five-star review on iTunes or whichever platform you choose. But if you're old-fashioned, go ahead and write a message to us on a medical chart, like an actual pen and paper chart. Stuff it, put it back in the rack, and then you can watch a younger ER doc just freeze in place without a computer record. (laughs) Stare at it, and maybe we'll get the message eventually. It'll be fun. (laughs) 
Do you guys use though. Do you guys use tea sheets here? Or are you like? <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, the poor historians are sending out AMA. Uh, yeah, so the first skit is like... This is classic. Like, it's pretty classic, I think. We don't um, need accents. We just... Yeah, one of us nope, needs to be a... Just... One of us needs to be a second year resident. That's And the other one needs to be an intern. That's all you got. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. So... I can I can do the intern. Try to try to channel all the... Oh, it's fish. I am... Yeah, see, he gets it. Do you get it? Yeah. yeah. What's that from? The um, uh, House of God. Yeah, he got it right away. See, he got a, it right away. Yeah, that's a I didn't cut. even read the book. I just read the first couple pages, but fish was in it. It's a, such a pull. It's such a like good reference to get from a few pages. When did you read them? Yeah. Um, before I started residency. You, can, you pulled that from then. Yeah, I. That's impressive. Amazing. Uh, Mike's brain is Mike's brain is amazing. It's Man. different. It's just it's different. different. <laughs> it does. It's, it's it does. such an obscure. It is like, amazing though. <laughs> I've read this book twice, mm-hmm. uh, and I I was even like, oh, I want to use a character's name from it just for fun, and I had to look it up. So I'm you did oh yeah I'm I'm thoroughly embarrassed with myself. It's yeah I remember lyrics too. Found this um this radio had rare tracks CD that had songs that you can't find on Spotify. He put it in first note hits. I sing along with the entire song. I haven't heard that song in thirty years. Well, nice. Fair enough. I just, yeah. yeah, I can recall things like that. I can't remember, honestly, like part of my day today. Sure, sure. There's always a give and take. Which mm-hmm. is more useful? I mean, definitely the 30-year-old radio head lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to uh, be fun when you get demented, man. Oh, They'll be like, what God. happened today? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> like an encyclopedia <laughs> so 50 years ago. Then you now. sing along with the music and put the, yeah. the lyrics back in. Oh, I remember oh. this tune. <laughs> <laughs> this paranoid android. They turn it into a... Elevator music. Yeah, you realize creep is going to be elevator music by the time we mm-hmm. get old. Yeah, it's it already right is. somewhere. The song is already like what, almost forty years old. Thirty yeah, years. Radiohead, the band when you need to sleep <laughs> 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 or get turned. Uh-huh. It's the best band. <laughs> oh, excellent! Medicine is that what Fish's character was like? Uh, More I, or less. You know, I don't remember. He's, they were all because I think he yeah. was. He was not the one that was going after the best resident award, but he was. Um, he was definitely like. Try, I think he was. The, he was like the chief, or like he was the the best resident, or whatever. Mm. And uh, I, in this, I made him a second but the cool year. But, resident. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he was no, because that's the fat man. That's fats. Oh, that's right, fat man. Yep. Yeah, fat man. Uh, yep. But you he noticed- had a little. He had a little coat. <clears throat> no, I don't know that he did. You get a long he, coat when you're a resident. Big man. Fortuna, man. man in yeah. a little he had a plan. <laughs> Big Fortuna for the stars. It is amazing how quickly you feel like you are the absolute ruler of the earth when you're a second year. Oh my it's God! Yeah, only to be broken down say, later. You're like, yep, I know that, everything, man. Uh-huh. I'm so, I'm so great. In that I'm moment, so good. You knew everything that there yeah. could possibly. Need, that you could possibly need to know about mm-hmm. medicine, but you mm-hmm. also had absolutely zero experience. So you, you didn't know how to apply it. Into, one year. You'd wade into anything, man. Uh-huh. Sure. You'd get like anything came in. You're like, I got that. I know. That's why they do the airways so. probably second year. Cause you're like, yeah, I, I cannot fail. <laughs> you know, second like, year of residency so is the uh, Dunning Kruger effect in so much force. confidence. Yeah. yeah. Then in the third oh, year, man. you're like, I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> You're Wait. holding onto legs as you leave. <laughs> no, no, oh. <laughs> no, don't make me go out there, please. Oh.